This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We don't need to join Peter's club of the head of sore hair when he walked out on the water, began looking to things around him, and Jesus had to grab him up by the hair to keep him from drowning. How many of you felt like you've been there a few times? Top of your head sore because the Lord saved me, but boy, I sure smarted. He chastises us because he loves us. Let's read on verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers, human fathers, who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Maybe that's another reason why we have generations that don't respect their parents. There was no correction with love. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastised us, as seem best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Uh-oh. The correction of God sets you up to be partakers of his holiness. Why is that important without holiness? How many get to see God? No man will see God. Now, no chastising seems to be joyful for the present. Nobody stood up and said, Woohoo! I get a whooping today at five. Nobody does that. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. Even the Father, when He corrects us, it's out of love. And as parents, we need to make sure that we correct out of love because it's awful easy to correct in frustration. Especially when you have one last hair that hadn't stand straight up by what your kid is doing and they take that hair and pluck it off the top of your head. And they think that you're stepping back counting to ten for your sake is so that you don't take them up because you brought them into the world at times. Correction by the Holy Spirit is proof that we are sons, that we're in the kingdom. And so if the Holy Spirit ever got on your case after you got saved and you wondered if you were saved or not, that's proof. The devil is not going to convict you of sin. He may try to condemn you because of sin, and there's a difference. Conviction is you need to change and to return to Shub, to return back to the ways of God for your sake. Conviction is, you old dirty dog, you're never going to change, you're never worth anything. The Holy Spirit will never ever tell you that because you were worth so much to Jesus that he went to the cross for you. Can you hear the difference? Conviction and condemnation are two different things. And people moving by a religious spirit will be quick to condemn, not to be agents of conviction. Now, our response to God's love, John 14, 15. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. Do you know that's not a new commandment? That's an old commandment. Jesus was asked one day, they tried to, they, the, the, the Pharisees loved to pe- put people in dilemmas. And dilemmas are, and I've seen attorneys use these because you're taught this in debate, that whether you answer yes or no, you're wrong. That's a dilemma. Have you ever seen them like on Perry Mason where the guy tries to explain, they say, just say yes or no. Sometimes the, the answer is this, but they, they want to put you into the dilemma, so no matter which one you answer, you're going to look bad to the jury. Well, the Pharisees love to do that, so they ask them, what's the greatest commandment? Well, that, that in, from human perspective, is kind of arbitrary. If you had people steal from you, then the greatest commandment would seem to you is, thou shalt not steal, because you were personally touched by that violation, weren't you? Or if you had children that never respected you and went off into sin and, and everything else, or, you know, respect your mother and father, that would be important to you. Or, or if you had a mate that had committed adultery, that would be a, well, that's the greatest commandment. Jesus bystepped all that landmine, and he looked them in the eyes, and he quoted the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And oh, by the way, there's another one like and unto it. You're going to love your neighbor as yourself. All the prophets, the Torah and the prophets hinge on these two things. It's the principle of the kingdom. God told the children of Israel, if you love me, keep my commandments. When you get my commandments, guess what? You get the whole first part of Deuteronomy 28. You hear and you do. Life is good. You hear and you don't do, life becomes bad. How many know disobedience is rough? We had a king of Israel that Samuel looked at and told Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. And sometimes people will tell you they're sacrificing for the Lord. When they're not sacrificing for the Lord, they're reaping their disobedience and trying to whitewash it and saying, well, I'm just suffering for the Lord. Real suffering you can see going on in the Middle East today. The people are losing their lives for their testimony of Jesus, not reaping what they have sown. The Apostle John also says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, Now by this we know that we know Him. Okay. Now you can know that you're saved, because he corrects you. But how am I going to know that you're saved? Well, haven't you seen my membership card at First Church? I mean, I've been baptized so many times, I still look like a prune. Is that what the Word says? By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There's a lot of the hypergrace church in, 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 in jeopardy right now. But he doesn't stop there. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's straight shoot, didn't it? And what is the Apostle John known for? He's the apostle of correction. No, he's the apostle of love. (laughs) When you look at each one of the apostles, historically each one of them will have a word or a category that that, that, that expresses their entire apostleship. The apostle John was the apostle of love. And he looked men right in the eyes and said, if you say that you know Jesus and you're not keeping the commandments of God, you're a liar. Because a lot of times, love doesn't beat around the bush. It doesn't hem-haw. It just tells you the truth and a firmness that is expressed in love that you know 
that because what he was talking about the whole first John was people with the antichrist spirit were coming into the church to contaminate the church and so what he he was straight shooting with them saying listen if they do these things spirit of god they do these things antichrist spirit very simple and he said it in a pastoral epistle because he loved He doesn't stop there. But whoever keeps his word, now he's not switching subjects. When he talks about his word, what's he talking about? The commandments. Okay? He that keeps his word, truly, the love of God is perfected in him. So learning how to begin disciplining your life and following the leading of the Holy Spirit and learning the Word of God and begin disciplining yourself to the commandments of God that it causes love to do something in you. You know, when you get older, you're supposed to mature. Now, for some people, that's kind of hard concept to grasp at times because you look at some of what older people do and say well you know you, you didn't get the memo but I, I remember when Mary and I first got married I, I loved I loved her like crazy but I was immature and you can love like crazy and still love all the wrong ways any woman get a testimony about that okay as you mature, your way of expressing love matures. It's perfected. And a fellow will find himself not saying the stupid things he used to say and doing the stupid things he used to do out of love. You know? changing he's not a bachelor anymore and he's, he's got to change things he begins putting family first that's out of love because love can mature and spiritually the dynamic that brings maturity to your love is keeping the commandments according to the apostle john then he goes on to say and this by this we know that we are in him he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. How many know Jesus kept the commandments? Not only did he keep the commandments, he kept them perfectly because he was the Torah made flesh and he was without sin or blemish. Let's go to Romans. This one's going to be fun. I'm not going to be able to fully get into everything I wanted to get into. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. Here's the love again. For he who loves who loves another, fulfilled the law. Okay? Now I'm going to read on, but I want, I'm going to... So there's that word fulfilled. Everybody says, well, see, the law's been done away with because in English, fulfilled is like fulfilling a contract. Now that you're... You know, it's like paying off your mortgage. How many know that when you get your mortgage paid off, you don't have to send the bank any money the next month? Okay? And we interpret it that, that way because we're reading it in English. For the commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covenant. If there be any other commandment, for all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now that argument sounds real good in English, but those that try to preach this never go to the Greek. Never ever. In verse 8, where it said fulfilled, it is pleruu, the same word that Jesus said, do not think that I have come to destroy or set aside the law, but to fulfill it. Pleruu means to make full, to fill up, to cause to abound, to flourish, to supply liberally. In other words, love is the motivation that causes the commandments to be expressed properly and to fulfill their mission and what they're supposed to do in our lives. Jesus said the way that I teach Torah, you can understand it as God originally intended it since he was the author, and this is how you do it. 
pretty easy. But I've seen what the rabbis have done with Torah. And for a while, I've got books that are actually from the Jewish Publishing Society, and I've got a small library of those. And the ones that they came out was called A Daily Dose of Torah. And I thought, great, Torah teaching. And I went through half of one volume that basically dealt with how do you give to the poor on Sabbath? That's real easy. Right? No, it's not. Because they made their own, they made their own rules that if you have money in the house and it goes outside the house, they defined it as commerce. Well, you're not allowed to do commerce on the Sabbath. And so if you give, so the if poor comes to the door and you give him a dollar or give him a denarii or whatever the case may be, you're doing commerce even though he hadn't given you anything. You know, there's one thing with, you know, the Fuller Brush Man coming on the Sabbath and you buying, a, you know, $200 worth of stuff. And there's a whole difference between that and somebody coming that are, that's hungry and that needs help. But that's what man did with the commandments. That's what they were doing. But yet, love brings it down to its simplest expression. Somebody in need, I help. Isn't that what Jesus did every time he healed somebody on the Sabbath? Now, it was actually when he healed on the Sabbath, it was a sign that he was Messiah. But what his motivation was, as the people of God gathered to hear Torah on the Sabbath, if there was a physical need, he was moved by love to heal them. And thus the word, the Torah, was fulfilled every time that Jesus... That's even why many times when, he, when there's one section that in Matthew where he said, he healed everybody that was in the city. And he said, thus it was fulfilled what the prophet said. Because he was, he was, he was pleru'u, he was fulfilling prophecy. He was, he was causing it to be accessible to the people. Now, that was early on in his ministry. Did he continue healing people after that? Absolutely. So if it was fulfilled there so that it could be set aside, why was he still doing it thereafter? Because we're hearing with wrong ears. We're not hearing with Hebraic ears. But the second one here in verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. It is a different word. It, it, it comes from the same root word as pleru'u, and it's Pla which means that which is or has been filled, a ship in as much that it has been filled. And what, what, literally what it's doing is, is showing two different things. Because it not only shows a ship laden with merchandise, and, I, you know, it, it's, it's like when we had, our, we had the ice storm here, what, 12, 13 years ago? And, I mean, the, the cupboards were bare when you go to Walmart but luckily the roads were not really so bad. And we, we had some stores up here that, were, that uh, raised the price of bottled water by almost 100%. It was crazy. And so when Walmart heard about it, they got several semi-loads of water up to the Marshfield one, and they were actually selling water for half price what the normal price was. Because in, in, in the setting, when that ship came in, it was a great blessing to the community. It was loaded down with blessings. It would, it would have rare spices and things you couldn't get locally. And how many know that if you've ever cooked, spices are wonderful things, but back then they had to haul them all from India, so it had to come by ship. And that salt was so precious that Roman soldiers that could be paid in gold, many times they preferred to be paid in salt. That's how precious it was. And so he, he, th th this word, play, play ruma, is saying that when we love, it causes the commandments of God to be like that ship laden down with wonderful treasures that it begins blessing everybody around you. But don't stop there. There's more. Okay? It also paints a picture of a ship fully manned with sailors, rowers, and soldiers. You see, it's one thing to have a ship setting out there, and it just sets, and it just sets, and it just sets. But love added to the commandments 
causes the commandments to be empowered to do what they're supposed to do. Because only a ship that is fully manned can move. Oh, come on now. You see, we've lost this in the Hebraic heritage that we've allowed a religious spirit to come in. And so we got this old stinky rotten ship that the only thing that lives in it is rats. And we're calling that keeping the commandments because we're doing the commandments out of religious spirit and stick our nose up at anybody that's not doing them and have this attitude. I was just I mean, they, they start shaking, wagging their head and shaking their finger. I smell there's pork on your breath. Well, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to eat. Ah! We do not need to be Torah terrorists and kosher police. You see, one is going, and the other one is, here's another piece of the puzzle that you may need. And it may not be pork for somebody. It may be something else that would God the Holy Spirit in love and say, listen, here's a piece of the puzzle for you to pray about and consider, and here's some, here are some things on it that you need to look at. Because God didn't tell us not to eat pork because he didn't want us to enjoy the wonders of barbecue ribs. Or good crispy bacon. Or crunchy shrimp. He's doing what we do with our children. If you have a dog in the house and there's a dog food bowl full of food and the baby gets mobile, one of the first things you've got to tell them to do, get your hand out of that bowl. That ain't food. Ooh, yucky, make you sick. Well, God's dietary laws is his list of, ooh, yucky, that'll make you sick. Because I am the God who heals you. And if you don't eat this, it makes it easier on everybody. Love. And when we begin expressing the commandments out of love, it's because I'm keeping this commandment because I love you, I love God, and I respect the ways of God. And even though my flesh may want to go the opposite direction, I would rather err in love and keeping God's commandments. Come on. That's why when you borrow something, you bring it back. I mean, no, that's not just those etiquette. That's actually Torah. And how many church fights would have ceased with this Torah concept? I hire you to do something, and the, the, let's say I hire you to mow my yard and the lawnmower dies. Since I hired you, who fixes the lawnmower? Me. I lend you the lawnmower, and the lawnmower breaks, then you repair it before you bring it back. How many church fights? Because I've seen, I've seen church fights almost over a lawnmower. Because one deacon borrowed the lawnmower from somebody, then it broke, and he brought it back in pieces. <laughs> Said, your stupid lawnmower broke. Well, yeah, you ran over a rock the size of a basketball. You know, and then the fight's on because it was $400 to, to repair Brother Billy Bob's lawnmower. Well, if you'd obeyed the word, you'd have had it fixed because you love and respect the person that you borrowed it from. You see, it's all out of love. Ho, ho, ho. I'm going to have to add some more to my notes because we're going to have to pick this up because I still have two and a half pages here. So I'm going to have to add a little more for the next session. But love is the key. I heard Oliver McEachern years and years and years ago and he talked about the love walk. And he said the love walk is a very narrow path because how many know it's real easy to step outside of love? And he said, imagine life that God created this path for you. There's rattlesnakes on both sides. But as long as you stay on that path, the serpents and scorpions of the enemy can't get you. But he said, the moment you get into the flesh, you step off the path. That's why so many people that have had tried to do spiritual warfare and they get in the flesh 
over it, they get their heads beat in. Jude warns us about that, that even when Michael, when he was confronting Lucifer over the body of Moses, didn't get haughty and in his face with a riling accusation, he said, the Lord rebukes you. So even the archangel Michael knew that he had to move in love as he delegated authority that we have from him can only operate in love. Because, I, mean, I mean, it could have been a match for the ages. I mean, they could have went toe-to-toe, and it's on. Michael's going to beat the devil from one end to the other, and he's going to show him who's boss. He kicked him out of heaven once. Didn't happen that way. Because Michael saw what happened to Lucifer when he got in the flesh. And iniquity was birthed in him. And when we get in the flesh and step outside of love, we're back in his territory. The commandments, the kingdom ceases to function in that moment. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store dot biblical dash life dot com that's store dot biblical dash life dot com